Hi, React Rally. Uh, I am James Kyle. I work at the Facebook. Um, I recently just joined the Flow team, I'm repping swag. Uh, yeah, uh, which is a static type checker for JavaScript. Uh, right now, I'm in charge of the love and care of our community. So um, please use Flow so I can keep my job. Uh, I was also Sebastian McKenzie's better half on Babel. Uh, well, he did everything, but I looked pretty, so basically the same amount of contribution. Uh, I also sometimes maintain this project called Lerna, which does something. Uh, anyways, if you want to make a bad decision, you can follow me on Twitter, at the James Kyle, or alternatively, you can make a good decision and follow Denny's Diner. Because they're way funnier. Just, just one more. <laughs> Anyways, this is uh, my first time in Utah, and so far it's been pretty nice. Uh, however, I have a bit of a problem. Uh, you see, whenever I travel to speak in a new place, I have to sort of like rib on the place to like bring it down to my level. Um, the problem is, I don't know anything about Utah. Um, I know so little about Utah that I had to Google Utah facts. That, that's in my history now. It's there. Uh, and I was actually a bit surprised what came up. Uh, at the top of the page, there was this panel with those state trees and state flower type things. Uh, and then I saw what your state bird is. The California gull. I live in California. You can't have your gull, our gull. Like, you can't get your own? Let's see, oh God. Then I noticed your state motto. It's just industry. <laughs> That's not a motto. That's just a word. <laughs> you want to know what a real state motto is? Let me show you how my home state, Massachusetts, does it. Ends a something. Uh, let me translate that for you. She seeks with the sword a quiet peace under liberty. That is some poetic Latin mottoing right there. Liber like you, the Liberty, you didn't think it were Texas or something, but you'd be wrong because the actual Texas motto is just friendship. <laughs> like, Texas, are you feeling okay? There is a severe lack of gun in their motto. But even that doesn't compare to New Jersey's motto. Anyways, I'm very happy to be here. Let's talk about some data structures. Uh, so I know what you're probably thinking. Data structures are awesome. Uh, and you'd be right, because they're very important. Not just to pass Computer Science 101, uh, but in order to be a better programmer. Knowing your data structures can help you manage complexity and make your programs easier to follow, and build highly performant, memory-efficient programs. The first of those is the one I think is more important. Using the right data structure can drastically simplify what would otherwise be complicated logic. But the second point is also important. If performance or memory matters, then using the right data structure is more than often essential. So what are data structures? Essentially, they are different methods of storing and organizing data to serve a number of different needs. Data can always be represented in a number of different ways. However, depending on what type of data you, need, you have and what you need to do with it, one representation will probably be a better choice than all the others. To understand why, let's first talk about algorithms. Algorithms is just a fancy name for a step-by-step -step set of operations to be performed. Data structures are implemented with algorithms, and algorithms are implemented with data structures. It's data structures and algorithms all the way down until you reach the tiny microscopic people with mic uh, punch cards that control the computer. Uh, yeah, Intel is enslaving people. Wake up, sheeple. <laughs> Any given task can be implemented in an infinite number of ways. So for common tasks, there are often many different algorithms people have come up with. For example, there's an absurd number of set it, uh, algorithms for sorting in a set of unordered items. There's insertion sort, there's selection sort, merge sort, bubble sort, there's heap sort, quick sort, shell sort, tim sort, and bucket sort. There are more, but you get the point. Uh, 
Some of these are significantly faster than others. Some use less memory. Some are easy to implement. Some are based on assumptions about the data set. Every single one of them will be better for something. Uh, so you'll need to make a decision based on what your needs are. And for that, you'll need a way of comparing them, a way to measure them. When we compare the performance of algorithms, we use a rough measurement of their average and worst case performance with something called big O. Big O notation is a way of roughly measuring the performance of algorithms in order to compare one against the other when discussing them. Big O is a mathematical notation that we borrowed in computer science to classify algorithms based on the how they respond to the number of items that you give them. There are two primary things that you measure with Big O. Time complexity, which refers to the total count of operations an algorithm will perform given a set of items. And space complexity, which refers to the total memory an algorithm will take up while running a given set of items. We measure these independently from one another because while an algorithm may perform less operations than another, it may also take up way more memory. Depending on what your requirements are, one may be a better choice than the other. So these are some common big O's. We have their name, their number, and how you feel when they show up at your party uninvited. There's constant, or O1, which means we're always going to have the same amount of operations. And when you see this friend walk in, you're like, oh my god, we need to take a selfie right now. Next is logarithmic, or O log of n, which means the number of operations increases very slowly as you add more items. When this friend shows up, you're like, hey, let me get you a drink, and let's do this up. The next is linear, or ON, which means the number of operations increases at the same rate as the number of items. When this person shows up, you're like, oh, hi. How's it going? Yeah, it's, it's been a while. We should catch up later. Uh, next is line, uh, I always call it line arithmetic. Uh, linear arithmetic, or ON log of N, where the number of operations increases a bit faster than the rate of linear. Uh, when this person shows up, you're like, uh, who brought them? They smell like soup. Uh, next is polynomial, or O n to the power of 2, where the number of operations increases exponentially and quickly gets to be way too many. Uh, when this person shows up, you get in their face like all salty, like, hey, I don't remember inviting you, but I was drunk the other day, so maybe that was it. <laughs> Last is factorial, or O factorial of n, when the number of operations just shoots straight up, like getting into the billions and trillions, quadriplegic aliens really, really fast. Uh, when this person shows up, you're like, uh, I invite you for a very specific reason, and that reason is I hate your guts. So bye. <laughs> to give you an idea of how many operations we're talking about, let's look at what these would equal given the number of set of items. So with five items, nothing is really bad. You can already see a big difference between constant and uh, uh, factorial. Um, uh, but by 10, you've already got a big difference for polynomial. Uh, it's already in the uh, millions of operations. Uh, but everything, that was scary. Uh, but everything else is acceptable. Next you have 20, and then by 30, polynomial has just gotten absurd. Like, and you can already see the others are going much faster than constant log or logarithmic, uh, but don't forget that we're only talking about 30 items. Like, if you're talking about a large data set of like millions of people, like items, uh, it, th these would be in the millions and trillions and ridiculous numbers. Uh, so with data structures, you have four primary types of operations you can perform. Accessing, searching, inserting, and deleting. It is important that, to note that data structures may good at, be, be good at one action, but bad at another. Uh, here you can see three common types of ordered data structures, uh, arrays, linked lists, and binary search trees, and their average time complexity with the most common operations. Uh, you can see that like, array is really good at accessing, but like, just okay at everything else. And binary search tree, on the other hand, is like, good at pretty much everything. Uh, and there's them with the party descriptions. Uh, even further, some actions will have different average performance and a worst case scenario performance meaning they perform very differently depending on the data set. There is no perfect data structure, and you choose one over another based on the data that you're working with and things that you're going to do with it. This is why it's important to know a number of different common data structures so that you can choose from them. A computer's memory is pretty boring. It's just a bunch of ordered slots where you can store information. You hold onto memory addresses in order to find information. Let's imagine a chunk of memory like this. 
you've ever wondered why things are zero indexed in programming languages before, it's because of the way memory works. If you want to read the first chunk of data, you read from zero to one. The second, you read from one to two. Uh, so the address that you hold on to each of those is zero and one, respectively. Uh, your computer has way more memory than this. And this is just a, con it's just a continuation of the pattern above, pretty much. Memory is a bit like the Wild West. Every program running on your machine is stored within the same physical data structure. Without layers of abstraction over it, it would be very difficult to use. But these abstractions serve two additional purposes. Storing data in memory that a, in a way that is more efficient or faster to work with. Uh, storing data in a way that makes it easier to use. Okay, so now we've covered a bunch of the basic stuff, we're giving some like language for it all. Uh, so let's dive into actual data structures. We're gonna cover lists and hash tables and stacks and queues and graphs and link lists and trees and binary search trees, so let's just jump into it. Uh, but don't worry about understanding all of this code. It's only to act there as an aid to the things that I'm saying. To demonstrate the raw interaction between memory and a data structure, we're first gonna implement a list. A list is a simple representation of an ordered sequence of values where the same value may appear many times. There are four kind, uh, uh, types of uh, primary operations to add and remove items. Uh, you're probably already familiar with them for array because a list is basically an array in JavaScript. Um, uh, starting with push, we need a way to add items to the end of our list. It is as simple as adding the, a value to the address at the end of our list and then we store the uh, length to calculate that and we inc increase the length. Pushing an item to the end of a list is constant. It's always gonna take the same amount of time. Push and pop both operate on the end of a list and overall are pretty simple operations because they don't need to be concerned with the rest of the list. But let's see what happens when we operate at the beginning of the list with unshift and shift. In order to add a new item at the beginning of the list, we need to make room for our value by sliding all of the other values over by one. In order to slide all of the items over, we need to iterate through each one, moving the previous value over. Because we have a way to iterate, or because we have to iterate over a single, every single item in the list, unshifting an item uh, at, to the start of a list is linear. Uh, finally, we need to write a shift function to move in the opposite direction. We just delete the first value and then slide everything back over. And it's pretty much the same exact code, just backwards. Um, the code, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was like down here. Uh, shifting an item from the start of a list is linear. Uh, next we have hash tables. Uh, hash tables don't have any order to them. Instead we have keys and values where we compute an address in memory using the key. If you're wondering, yes, these are exactly what objects are in JavaScript. Uh, the idea that we have keys, the idea is that we have keys that are hashable, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, and they can be used to add, access, and remove data from memory very efficiently. In order to store key value pairs in memory from our hash table, we need a way of, to take the key and turn it into an address. We do this through an operation known as hashing. All that happens is that we take a key and serialize it into a unique number for that key. So you have to be careful though. If you have a really big key, you don't want to mem match it with a memory address that doesn't exist. You don't want to like, go infinitely. Um, so the result uh, is that hashing algorithms need to limit their size, which means there are a limited number of addresses for an unlimited number of values. The result is that you can end up with collisions places where two keys can get turned into the same address. Any real world hash table implementation would have to deal with this. However, we're just gonna glaze over it and pretend that doesn't happen. Uh, so let's set up our hash key function. Don't worry about understanding the bit shift operators and all the weird stuff happening here. Just know that it accepts a string and outputs a mostly unique address that we can use for all of our other functions. <laughs> From this point forward, we're gonna stop interacting directly with memory as the rest of these data structures start to be implemented with other data structures. These data structures focus on doing two things, organizing data based on how it's used and abstracting away implementation details. These data structures focus on creating an organization that makes ver sense for various types of programs. They insert a language that allows you to discuss more complicated logic, all of this while abstracting away implementation details so their implementation can be changed to, make, to be made faster. 
Stacks are very similar to lists in that they have an order, uh, but they limit you to only pushing and popping values at the end of the list, which we saw as before are very fast operations that map directly to memory. However, stacks can also be implemented with other data structures in order to add functionality to them. The most common uses of stacks is places where you have one process adding items to a stack, another process removing them from the end, prioritizing that, the things that were added most recently. Next, we're going to build a queue which is complementary to stacks. The difference is that you remove items from the start of the queue rather than the end, uh, removing the oldest items rather than the most recent. Again, this limits the amount of functionality, uh, so there are many different ways of implementing it. Uh, a good way might to be use like a linked list or something. There's other tons of different things you can do, um, but you'll see that later. The next data structure is a graph. Uh, note that these are different than a visual graph that you might use to represent data. Instead, imagine it like this. We have a bunch of nodes, A, B, C, D, E, that are connected with lines, one that points to another. These nodes are going to look like this. They have a value and they have lines that are just references to the other nodes. Uh, and then the whole graph looks like this. And we have that array just as to like, keep a list of all of them. Uh, so yeah, we'll hold on to all the nodes in the regular JavaScript array, uh, and not because there's any particular order, but because we just need a way of store, storing references to everything. We can start to add values to our graph by creating nodes without any lines. Next, we need to be able to look up graphs, nodes in the graph. Most of the time, you have another data structure on top of a graph to make searching faster. Uh, but for our case, we're simply going to search through all of the nodes to find the one with the matching value. This is a slower option, but it works for now. Next, we can connect two nodes by making a line from one to the other. First, we find the nodes for each value. We freak out if one wasn't found. Uh, and then we just push a reference to the end node from the start node. Finally, you can use uh, a graph like this. And this might seem like a lot of work to do pretty little, uh, but it's actually a quite powerful pattern, especially for finding sanity in very complex programs. They do this by optimizing for the connections between data rather than operating on the data itself. Once you have one node in the graph, it's extremely to find, simple to find all of the related items in the graph, and you can just keep expanding from there. Tons of, these, tons of things can be represented this way, users with friends, the 800 transitive dependencies in a node modules folder. Uh, the internet itself is a graph of web pages connected together by links. Next, we're going to see how a graph-like structure can help op optimize an ordered set of item, uh, list of data. Link lists are a very common type of data structure. Uh, they get used pretty often to implement other data structures because of its ability to efficiently add items to start, middle, or end. The basic idea is it's a, of a linked list is similar to a graph. You have no, noids, nodes uh, that point to other nodes that look sort of like this. Uh, and then you can visualize them as a JSON structure like that. Um, but unlike a graph, a linked list has a single node that starts off the entire chain. This is known as the head of the linked list. We're also going to track the length. Uh, first, we need a way to retrieve a value from a given position. This works differently than normal lists, and we can't just jump to the correct position. Instead, we need to move through all of the individual nodes. So searching is kind of slow. Uh, we start at the head of the list, and then we loop through all of the items using node next until we reach the specified position. And then we just return what we found. Next, we need a way to add nodes to the specified position. We're going to write a generic add method that accepts an, a value and a position. So you just create a node. Uh, you do a little special case if it's the first position because you're replacing the head. Um, otherwise, you go to the position before it, you get the current one, and then you sort of like pull them apart and shove something in the middle and link them together again, uh, which is that. Um, and then you just increment the length. Finally, you have removing uh, a node. Uh, so we're just splicing it out of the chain. Uh, again, do something special for the first uh, position, uh, and then everything else, we get the position before it, and just set the position before it to like the skip one behind it, uh, and decrement length. The remaining two data structures we're going to cover are both in the tree family. Much like real life, there are many types of tree data structures, like a lot. Um, 
Little did you know you'd be studying dendrology today. Uh, and that's not even all of them. But don't let any of this scare you. Most of those don't matter at all. There were just a lot of computer science PhDs who had something to prove. <laughs> Trees are much like graphs or linked lists, except they are unidirectional. This means they can't have loops or references, uh, loops of references. Uh, if you can draw a loop between connected nodes in a tree, you don't have a tree. Uh, trees have many different uses. They can be used to optimize searching or sorting. They can organize programs better. They can give you a representation that is easier to work with. We'll start off with a, simple, a very simple tree structure. Uh, it doesn't have any special rules, and it looks something like this. You have a value with children with more nodes that have values and children just forever. Um, so the tree has to start with a single parent, the root of the tree. Uh, and then we need a way to traverse our tree and call a function on each node in the tree. So we define a walk function that we can call recursively on every single node in the tree. First, we call our traversal callback on the node, and then we iterate through all the children and call a walk function on them to just recurse forever. Uh, and now we just kick the traversal off from the root. That's it. Next, we need a way to add nodes to our tree. Uh, first, we create a new node that we're going to add. Uh, if there's no root, we just set it to the new node. Uh, ooh, I, whoa. Uh, then we traverse through everything, uh, trying to match the node to the value that we're trying to set as the parent uh, so that we can push the node to its children. This is one of the most basic trees that you could have uh, and doesn't give you a whole lot of extra things. Uh, it's probably only useful uh, if the data you are representing actually resembles a tree. Uh, but with some extra rules, a tree can serve a lot of different purposes. Binary search trees are a fairly common form of tree for their ability to efficiently access, search, insert, and delete values, all while keeping them in a sorted order. Imagine taking a sequence of numbers and turning it into a tree starting from the center. This is how a binary tree works. Each node can have two children. The left is less than the parent node's value, and the right is greater than the parent node's value. In order to make this work, all of the nodes in the tree need to be a unique number, or value. This makes traversal to find a value very efficient. Say we're trying to find the number five in our tree. We go from starting at four, we go five is greater than four, so we move right, and five is less than six, so we move left, and we've reached five. Uh, and to do this, we've only had to do three checks to reach the number five. Uh, and if we were to expand this tree to 1,000 items, you'd go for like 500, 250, 125, 62, 31, 15, seven, three, four, five. And so it's only 10 checks for 1,000 items to find that's in there. Uh, if you were to go through iteratively, you would reach five pretty quickly. You'd reach it in less than 10 operations, but if you're trying to reach 999, it would take you 999 to search through every single item that way. So the average performance is better. Uh, the other important thing to note about binary search trees is that they're very similar to linked lists in that the sense that you only need to update the immediately surrounding items when adding or removing a value. So same as the previous tree, we'll have a root of our binary search tree. In order to test if a value exists in the tree, we first need to search through the tree. Uh, we start at the root, and then we're gonna keep running as long as we have another node to visit. If we reach the left or right that is null, then this loop just ends, and we know we, it's not in the, in the tree. Oops. Uh, if the value is greater than the current value, we move to the right, and if it's less than the current value, we move to the left. If it's neither greater than or less than, we assume it's equal to, so we return true. If we haven't matched anything, then we return false. In order to add items to this tree, we're going to do the same traversal as before, bouncing between left and right nodes, depending on them being less than or greater than the value we're adding. However, this time, when we reach a left or right value that is null, we're gonna add a new node in that position. So let's first set up our node. And again, special case when it's at the root. Uh, and we'll start at the root and we'll start this like current variable that we'll just keep resetting in this loop. Uh, don't do that in most code, but in this case it works because logically it'll never repeat forever. Uh, but we're just gonna keep looping until we find uh, our, 
we added an item or we've discovered it already exists in the tree. If the value is greater than the current value, we move to the right. If the right does not exist, we set it to our node and stop traversing. Otherwise, we just move on to that node and to its children. If a value is less than the current value, we move to the left. And we do the same check, or if it does not exist, we set it to our node and stop traversing. Otherwise, we continue to the left side of the tree. If the, the number isn't less than or greater to, we assume it's equal to again, and we don't do anything. And that's all. Uh, that's from like no knowledge to binary search tree. Um, but before I go, I want to do something. So I want to make this available to everyone. Oh, geez, what's my password? Oh! <laughs> it is now public. Uh, if you go to my GitHub and don't log into it, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna change that really fast before someone does. Uh, I only have two factor on. Uh, yeah, you can, you can come check out all this code and read it. Anyways. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks React Rally. Don't tack my account. Uh, and <laughs> thanks, State of Utah. Uh, go industry.